<laughs> so I'd like to get started by just one line from the Bible, and that comes from uh, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Words have power. Their meaning crystallizes perceptions that shape our beliefs, drive our behavior, and ultimately relate our world. Their power arises from our emotional responses when we read, speak, or hear them. Words can build up and tear down. Words are singularly the most powerful force available to humanity. We can choose to use this force constructively with words of encouragement or destructively to, uh, the, uh, to use these words for despair. Words have power. Uh, they have the power with the ability to help, to heal, to hinder, to hurt, to harm, to humiliate, and to humble. In speaking of the experiences and advice of others, I hope that we might gain a better understanding of others, of our own lives. You can decide how to proceed with the rest of your life and my life. Words affect lives. And I'd read, like to read to you a poem by Emily Dickinson. It's her opinion, and it's very brief. And this is what she has to say. The title of her poem is, A Word is Dead. And it goes like this. <clears throat> a word is dead when it is said. Some say, I say, it just begins to live that day. I watch a Greek serial. Before I tell you the name of it, because some of you might be aware of it, maybe one person here, I don't know, possible. It could be my sister who was <laughs> forced to, <laughs> to watch it. It, it takes, it takes place place in a village in Crete. And in Crete, not only in Crete, but other places, but this is Crete, they have vendettas, families going back. I see people from Crete here, <laughs> and they're going like this. Okay. <laughs> okay, and the vendettas go back for centuries. One has killed one in a family, another one has killed from another family. And it's perpetuated in this story. And what happens uh, with vendettas in this particular story, um, there's a priest, an old man, he's very wise. They all trust him and they all tell him his pro their problems, what they've done, including murder. The village now has come to a good understanding and they think the two families can get together and have peace to end this vendetta that's gone on for centuries. And they would choose a one from one family that they trust and another from another family that they trust. And that person would be a mediator and if it could be done, this mediation, it's called, in Greek, it's called sasmos. And that's the name of the serial, sasmos. It's a mediation. But they've come close in this serial to a mediation, but someone has come along to turn it, to turn one against the other again. They're very close. And here is the priest lamenting and saying, uh, Sasmos, 
The priest talks about bullets and bullets that kill. And I will quote in Greek and then tell you in English what it is. The priest says, Isfera inesandin juvenda. Ama figi ven girizi piso to kako egine. And in English it says, he says, a bullet is like a conversation. Once it leaves, it never comes back, but the killing and the damage has been done. And I interpreted that as, I see that not only bullets kill, but words kill. They can kill a person inside. I start with Maya Angelou. Many of you know who she is. Uh, very, very famous. Um, Maya has written many, many books. She's won Nobel Prizes. She's won, uh, I believe she was also the one that spoke at Clinton's uh, inauguration. This is what happened to Maya. This is connected with words. When Maya was eight years old, she was raped by her mother's boyfriend. They went to court, and this is what happened. Maya had to uh, testify, and we have. When she was eight years old, Maya Angelou stopped speaking. She silenced her voice because she thought her, ver her voice had killed the man. For almost five years, she spoke to no one but her brother. The man she believed she had killed with her voice, her mother's boyfriend, had raped her. After she testified against them in his trial, he was convicted and sentenced, but released from jail. Four days later, he was found dead, murdered, probably by Angelou's uncles, her memoir implies. She didn't speak again until she was 13 years old. I now have, when bad, terrible things happen um, and terrible words are spoken, I have uh, James Baldwin. James Baldwin's stepfather who he lived with for many years, kept calling him the ugliest person he's ever seen. He kept calling him ugly, you're ugly. And in one interview, there was an exhibition in 2019, um, uh, The Face of God, and it was a portrait by, uh, portraits done by a Harlem Renaissance painter uh, of James Baldwin in, in different poses. And the art critic uh, who had won a, a Pulitzer Prize for criticism had written in the New York Times about the following. He gave a whole review of the exhibition, but this is what he had said. My, my father said, during all the years I lived with him, that I was the ugliest boy he had ever seen. And I had absolutely no reason to doubt him. Then there's Abraham Maslow, the famous psychologist, who, whose father kept telling him, you are ugly, ugly ugly. 
to the point where he would get on a train here in Manhattan, and when people would get on, too many people would get on to the car he was at, he would move to a different car so they wouldn't be exposed to his ugliness. That's what he believed. Children learn what they live. And this is very interesting. It's interesting because there's a philosophy here that I will read to you, but I'll tell you where I actually got it from. Years ago, I, my brother is a postcard collector, and I was looking through his postcard collection of diners, all diners, all over the United States. And I like to turn the card, sometimes at the back of the card, somebody has written to somebody who was mailed, and collectors collect them. But this time around, this was written in the back of a diner card. If a child lives with criticism, he learns to condemn. If a child lives with hostility, he learns to fight. If a child lives with ridicule, he learns to be shy. If a child lives with shame, he learns to feel guilty. If a child lives without tolerance, he learn, if a child, I'm sorry, lives with tolerance, he learns to be patient. If a child lives with encouragement, he learns confidence. If a child lives with praise, he learns to appreciate. If a child lives with fairness, he learns justice. If a child lives with security, he learns to have faith. If a child lives with approval, he learns to like himself. If a child lives with acceptance, and friendship, he learns to find love in the world. And this was a diner, and it has underneath it, and I will read it to you. Sunset Diner and Restaurant, U.S. Highway 22, Greenbrook, New Jersey, 08812, phone 356-2674, over 40 years of service. And the next thing we have here is, it's important to remember that we are made in the image of God. We are worthy, we are loved, a person can turn their life around, and can turn their life around, that's what Mary J. Blige did, the singer. And I will read her tale. It was written a long while ago, and it was in the Week magazine that I subscribed to. And on one of the pages, they do a little blurb on a famous person. And this is Mary J. Blige. Blige's Goodbye to the Ghetto. Mary J. Blige has turned her life around. Twice, says the London Sunday Mail, the singer grew up in poverty in New York City, sharing a tiny apartment with her mother, sister, five cousins, and two aunts. Quotes, there was no respect for childhood. My aunts used to laugh at me when I sang. I had no one telling me to educate myself. They just wanted to keep me down like them. They tell me I was fat and ugly. They all told me I'd never finish high school. And I never did because I became the person they talked to me they talked me into being. 
Blige's voice was her saving grace at the age of 21. After she met Puff Daddy, he spotted her and she became a mega singer. But I was still trash. The difference was I was rich trash. I was all about spending the money, doing the cocaine, uh, wearing famous clothes. I was like the drug dealers I grew up with. Then she said uh, she met her husband who persuaded her to give up drugs and value herself. Today, Blige is totally devoted to self-improvement, reading voraciously, praying, and minding her manners. I used to talk street slang and do the whole rap thing, but I know that is just ignorance. I want to speak properly. I want people to understand me. I don't want to be part of that life anymore. Then there is a story, and it's called The Two Wolves. And that story goes like this. The Two Wolves. One evening, an old Cherokee told his grandson about a battle that goes on inside people. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves inside all of us. One is evil. It is anger, envy, jealousy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The other is good. It is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, and that uh, compassion and faith. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf wins? The old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. This has to do with a gift. We've all been gifts, given gifts. And this has to do with Christ and the gift. It could be God, it could be anybody, but we all were given very special gifts. And he talks about prison. And this is what he says. The Bible tells us Christ came to set the prisoners free. Does this mean people behind bars? Yes, it does. But not only iron bars, it means bars that people have erected in their own natures, behind which their personalities dwarf. Bars like hatred, Bars like prejudice, bars like inferiority, bars like inadequacies, bars like hopelessness. Behind these bars, people shrink inside self-centered prisons. You will never live in an exciting world 
until you burst out of your self-imposed prison. And that is what Christ has come to do, to set you free. Your world can be an exciting one. It is there for the taking. And the next thing is some people feel a sense of brokenness and they are suffering and they are searching to be able to make themselves whole. And in this, I like to walk around bookstores. That doesn't mean I read a lot of books. But I happened to, 20 years ago, look at a title of a book, and the title was <clears throat> Conversations with God. I picked it up, I read the back of the book, I read the front of the book, and I purchased the book. And the author is Neil Walsh, and he was a writer. And at that time, he was a broken man. And this is what he said. Quote, my life had become such a monument to struggle and failure in everything from the romantic relationships to my life work, to my interactions with my children, to my health, to everything. I was experiencing nothing but struggle and failure. So what he started to do, he started the people he felt hurt him, he would write angry letters. But he would never mail the letters. <laughs> so one day he, he sat with his yellow legal pad and he had a million questions, and he decides he's gonna turn to God. God, you know, and he's... And as the questions came, that was easy, the questions, all of a sudden, answers came to his mind. That was not his answers. He claims God answered him he had the pen on the yellow pad, but he was not doing the writing. God was doing the writing. The answers that God got and gave him, he just wrote. And this is, I'm taking just two excerpts. One of the questions is, to whom does God communicate? Are there special people? Are there special times? The answer is all people are special and all moments are golden. And then it begins, and this is what God tells him. I know how deeply you have desired the truth. In pain have you called out for it, and in joy unendingly you have beseeched me. Show myself, explain myself, reveal myself. So go ahead now, ask me anything. The whole universe will I use to do this. So be on the lookout. Listen, the words to the next song you hear, the information in the next article you read, the storyline of the next movie you watch, the chance utterance of the next person you meet, or the whisper of the next river, the next ocean, the next breeze that caresses your ear. All these devices are mine. 
I will speak to you if you will listen. I will come to you if you will invite me. I will show you then that I have always been there, always. Then we have Rabbi Kushner. Rabbi uh, Kushner's own personal life, uh, he became famous when he wrote uh, when, when bad things happen to good people, okay? Uh, but I'm going to tell you his little personal story before he wrote this. Uh, his son, Aaron, uh, when he was three, they had another daughter born. But when he, Aaron, was three, he was diagnosed with progeria. And progeria is when you grow super fast and you age super quickly. And at the age of 10, Aaron died. And at that age, he was equivalent to looking and being like a 60-year-old, and he was 10. So he chose then to write this book. And when the book was written, it hit the New York Times best seller list for years, okay? And I heard someone also say the name of the book. They're familiar with it. It's still, you can get it, and it's very, very interesting. But what happened is he had given it to many pub publishers, okay? And he got turned down, and finally Shokin Books accepted it, and the book got published. And this is what Rabbi Kushner says. It was my first inkling of how much suffering was out there all over the world. That religion was not coping with. And this is what he says. By the way, this is from his obituary. He died in March of, of this year, and this was the New York Times obituary. <clears throat> his thesis, as he wrote in the book, was straightforward. It becomes much easier to take God seriously as the source of moral values if we don't hold him responsible for all the unfair things that happen in the world. I don't know why one person gets sick and another does not, but I can only assume that some natural laws which we don't, which we don't understand are at work. I cannot believe that God sends illness in a specific person for a suspect, suspect, sorry, okay, yes, for, okay. I, I didn't, thank you. I, I don't believe in a God who has a weekly quota of malignant tumors to distribute and consults his con computer to find out who deserves one most or who could handle it best. What did I do to deserve this is not an understand, it's an understandable outcry but of a person who's sick and who's suffering, but it's really the wrong question. Being sick or being healthy is not a matter of what God decides that we deserve. The better question is, if this has happened to me, what do I do now? And who is there to help me? There's another doctor 
and she is a medical doctor, a physician, a therapist, and she uh, is a doctor of medicine, and she started a, an institute called the Raymond Institute, and she teaches nurses, medical students, doctors, anyone who deals with patients, how to be compassionate and caring. She even has a course, and her course is called the, the Study of Health and Illness, and it's required of medical doctors. They're required to take in most of the U.S. Uh, universities. <clears throat> we now come to a Greek, Nikos Kassanzakis. The story, some of you will know, uh, not Nikos Kassanzakis personally, but know of the film, the, his novel was made into the movie called Zorba, Zorba the Greek. And what had happened there was uh, Anthony Quinn played Zorba, and here's a larger-than-life human being. And he comes in contact with this Englishman. He watched this Englishman come off the boat with hundreds of suitcases, and he's just looking. He's in a cafe, and he's looking at him. And this Englishman has come to Greece because his grandfather has left them something in Greece, and he's come to find out why. So they get together, and guess what was in all those suitcases? I'll tell you what was only in one of them. His clothes. All the other suitcases he had brought from England to Greece were his books. But there was a serious moment. They get together, they're friends, he helps them out, okay? This larger than life person. And at one moment, a very serious moment, Zorba asks him, why do the young die? Why does anybody die? Tell me that. And the Englishman says, I don't know. And Zorba says, what's the use of all your damn books? If they don't tell you that, what the hell do they tell you? And the Englishman's answer is, they tell me about the agony of men who can't answer questions like yours. A little bit about Judy Collins, famous singer. Most of us know who she is in the older generation. <laughs> in the, not in the Taylor Swift generation. <laughs> All right. Ju Judy Collins wrote a book about her son's suicide at the age of 33 years old. And the toughest hurdle in her life to reach some sense of sanity. The book is entitled Sanity and Grace, A Journey of Suicide, Survival, and Strength. In it, she quotes the poet W.H. Auden, and this is what Auden has to say about suffering. They were never wrong, the old masters, how well they understood suffering it's, and its human position, how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just 
walking dully alone. I uh, tape on Sunday mornings before I come to church. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I tape three ministers, priests, uh, Joel Osteen, okay, uh, Reverend Jeremiah, and Dr. Stanley. And when I get a chance, I listen to them, okay? So, this is from Joel Olstein, and this is what he has to say about faith. And I thought it was important enough to bring it here. <clears throat> it's great to have faith for yourself, to believe in your dreams, pray for your healing, but God didn't give you faith just for you. There will be the people you encounter that feel overwhelmed. They're going through a sickness, going through a loss, having difficulty in a relationship. Maybe at one time they believed they were strong. They believed they could beat it, but now they are too discouraged. They're, they've lost their passion. The way they are going to see a breakthrough is not through their faith, but through the faith of a friend. You can be the one to help them believe again. You can be the friend. You can pray for them. You can encourage them. You can speak healing and victory over their lives. I want to push someone else into their destiny, which I believe will lift someone who is falling, who doesn't have the strength to get back up. I want to encourage someone who is down to speak about hope into their spirit, bring them dinner one night, uh, help them pay their rent. There is nothing more rewarding than helping someone move forward. You give your faith, God gives you more faith. You give your time, God gives you more time. You give encouragement, and God will give you more encouragement. And I have something, it's anonymous. I don't know where I got it, but I think it fits in with this. And it says, on the street, I saw a small girl, cold and shivering in a thin dress with little hope of a decent meal. I became angry and I said to God, why did you permit this? Why don't you do something about it? For a while, God said nothing. That night, he replied quite suddenly, I certainly did do something about it. I made you. Now I come to something that I picked up. It could have been from all these preachers, but it also could have been from one of the books of three books called, uh, one of them is called The Four Agreements, and it's a Toltec philosophy. But nevertheless, I wrote it here, and I'm bringing it forth to you. Stop running from hurts, anger, bitterness. Face the hard thing. Face 
what is or who has diminished your self-worth and forgive them. When you stop running and deal with what is hindering you, God will give you the grace. It is painful to confront the deep hurts you have lived through, but God will help you to confront them and forgive them. Only then can you be whole and complete the way God has made you. And a good quote to use is, I'm not going to allow the bitterness to destroy my life. And on this, Rabbi Kushner, I'm going to quote him again, describes forgiveness. And he says, forgiveness as a favor we do for ourselves, not a favor we do to the other party. And now I have something to read to you that I think is important, and it has to do uh, with Tina Turner. And Tina Turner, I believe, died last, last year. I think some of you know Tina Turner. <laughs> okay, here we go. The older generation. The older generation, yes, yes. And she talks about forgiveness. But she talks about other things too that are important. So here we go. Healing from within. As a kid, I wanted to get away from working in the cotton fields of Tennessee. I dreamed of going to Hollywood, although I had no idea where that was. Most of all, I dreamed of living a life filled with love and harmony. My mother did not want me, so I focused within for my sense of security. <clears throat> Even in my darkest days, I realized that when I sincerely strove to help myself and kept a peaceful, hopeful outlook, magical things happened. Eventually, I was able to heal my heart and give myself the love I hadn't received when I was young. I like to say that I changed poison into medicine and transformed the difficulties in my life to realize my dreams. Power and forgiveness. My mother and I got closer later in life and I forgave her. I helped her move out to Los Angeles where she saw my career breakthrough. And I forgave my former husband, Ike Turner, too, for years of domestic violence, black eyes, busted lips, broken bones, and psychological torture. At one point, I was so despondent, I swallowed 50 sleeping pills in a suicide attempt. But I had to make peace with my past, and forgiveness sets us free. I believe in karma, in cause and effect, so forgiving people for the wrongs they've committed is not the same as excusing their actions. Forgiveness is more about cutting the chains of negativity from whatever has caused us pain and positivity. Spirit, spiritually, I believe that all the hard times I went through set in my mission in life, giving hope to others so that they can become happy too. Through everything, my purpose was not only to survive and thrive myself, but also to be a positive example and encourage and inspire people uh, to never give up. Cherish yourself. I've had some health challenges in recent years, a stroke, a kidney transplant, colon cancer, 
Sometimes when we go through such difficult experiences, it can feel like we're in a never-ending winter and that spring will never come. But the greatest gifts of wisdom are often found within such challenges. I now have a heightened appreciation of everyday life and feel more deeply how precious our time on earth is. I want to keep encouraging as many people as I can to cherish their lives. If I can help even one more person to become happy, then I've succeeded. The music of life. It's healthy and important to keep a good sense of humor and maintain lighthearted thoughts, even when faced with serious matters or recalling something painful. Laughter is like music. It's, your, it's in your spirit. There's a Buddhist saying, wise people can always find a way to bring out a smile. Be natural. Maybe all one with nature. Some of us feel it more than others. I've always sensed that unseen universal hum and energy, the nourishing rhythm of nature. It connects us to one another and everything else on the beautiful planet joined by the mystical essence of Mother Nature, the fundamental energy that gives life to all things. Sing or don't. I don't perform anymore, and I don't miss it. I do other things and think any creative endeavor helps to nourish your soul, whether it's reading, writing, painting, singing, gardening, volunteering, or even caring for pets or loved ones. Anything that requires your heartfelt focus is creative energy. Aging gracefully. When I turned 80, we had a small celebration, which was lovely. I've definitely grown happier as I've matured, and I've even grown with patience and love for others. There is a change in perception, a broadening that comes with age, a greater appreciation for simple things, but you have to love yourself first. True beauty. People used to talk about my legs as much as they did about my talent, but I was blind to my own beauty. My advice to women who worry about aging is to nurture gratitude for your life. Remember that true beauty comes from within, from the positive qualities of your heart and mind. And most of all, be kind. Kindness is beautiful. Out of that will come happiness and happiness is sexy. <laughs> Words uttered with love can strengthen, guide, and inspire us. And I have a few selections that I've chosen uh, to read to you. And one of them is from a blogger, and this is what he writes about his mother. What mother means, and his name is Carl Fuchs, mother is such a simple word, but to me, there's me meaning seldom heard. For everything I am today, my mother's love has showed me the way. I love my mother all my days for enriching and changing my life in so many ways. She set me straight and set me free, and that's what the word mother means to me. 
And I had, I took out an article many years ago from the New York Times that was written by a Bronx High School of Science student. Do we have any teachers here from Bronx Science? No, only Hunter? Okay. I don't diminish Hunter when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> And this is what this Chinese young lady had to say about her mother and her experience. And it's called, and it was published in the Times, Five New Words at a Time. My family came to America in 1985. No one spoke a word of English. In school, I was in an English as a second language class with other foreign-born children. My class was so overcrowded that it was impossible for the teacher to teach English properly. I dreaded going to school each morning because of the fear of not understanding what people were saying and the fear of being laughed at. At that time, my mother, Tai, worked part-time in a Chinese restaurant from late afternoon until late at night. It was her unfamiliarity with the English language that forced her to work in a Chinese-speaking environment. Although her job exhausted her, my mother still woke up early in the morning to cook breakfast for my brother and me. I like, like, uh, uh, like her guarding her chicks. She never neglected us because of her fatigue. So it was not surprising that very soon my mother noticed something was troubling me. When I said nothing was wrong, my mother answered, you are my daughter. When something is bothering you, I feel it too. The pain and care I saw in her moon-shaped eyes made me burst into tears that I had held back for a long time. I explained to her the fear I had of going to school. My mother said, she cheerfully suggested that the two of us work together to learn the language at home with books. The confidence and determination my mother had were admirable because English was as new to her as it was to me. That afternoon, I saw my mother in a different light as she waited for me by the school fence. Although she was the shortest of all the mothers there, her face with her welcoming smile and big black eyes was the most promising. The afternoon sun shone brightly on her long black hair, creating an aura that distinguished her from the others. My mother and I immediately began reading together and memorizing five new words a day. My mother, with her encouraging attitude, made the routine fun and interesting. The fact that she was sacrificing her resting time uh, before going to work so that I could learn English made me see the strength she possessed. It made me admire my mother even more. Very soon, I began to comprehend what everyone was saying and people could understand me. The person solely responsible for my accomplishment and happiness was my mother. The reading also helped my mother learn English 
so that she was able to pass the postal entrance exam. Uh, it was seven, it has been seven years since that reading experience with my mother. She is now 43 and in her second year at college. My brother and I have a strong sense of who we are because of her strong values. My mother established for herself and for her children. That is why my mother is truly the guiding light of my life. And since we're on the topic of mothers briefly, uh, this person is a slam poet. She's entered many contests and won a lot of prizes. And this is what she wrote. Her name is Gail Danley, and this is what she wrote about her mother. Trying to get over the loss of her mama, Laverne, who died of lung cancer in 89, a poem about the loss titled Two Pearls is the one that she most cherishes. One line reads, between classes I learn, they must take your left lung and you use up your last breath to tell me to finish school and don't even think of giving up. And there is a poem that has to do with Langston Hughes, the American poet, and it has to do with the mother and the son giving advice, just like her mother gave advice of don't you quit school, and don't you dare give up. In Langston Hughes's poem, the mother talks about her life as going up a staircase, that's going up the ladder. And she talks to her son, and she's telling him, don't you dare give up. And this is the poem, it's called Mother to Son by Langston Hughes. Well, son, I tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor bare. But all the time, I's been a climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you set down on the steps cause you find it's kinda hard. Don't you fall now, for I still a going, honey. I still a climbing, and life for me ain't been no crystal stair. And this is for a woman we've been going, uh, my brother goes to dialysis, we've been going for two years, and we go with him, Paulette and I. And we've made friends with the people who go to dialysis, and we've made very close friends with the people who also wait to pick them up, and, and so on. And one of the person in dialysis, all summer long, she wore shorts, she's short and chubby, but she's got a sense of humor and she's going, okay? And she goes for dialysis. And one day she told Paulette, well, she told all of us that she has a grandchild in high school. She lives in Long Island and she comes up uh, maybe once a month and they spend time together. She lives here in Manhattan and they go shopping for her clothes. Grandma tells them, buy anything you want, and this is her relating to us. 
and then they go to a restaurant that they enjoy, and then after that, they're just talking to each other, they care about each other, and then they'll sit and watch television or movies together. She stays for the weekend and then goes back to school. She's in the high school. And then one day, she had to write essays for college. She wants to be a nurse, so, and this was the essay she had to write. She showed it to Paulette because she gave her a copy. And Paulette brings the copy out. Paulette says, I'm in tears. Look at this. I look at it. I'm going to read it to you now, OK? I said, I'm going to go in and tell her I'm going to do a lecture eventually on words. Can you get her to give you a copy? And I'd like you to come. She says, oh, Demetra. I don't go out after 4 o'clock. I said, oh, OK. But I have what she wrote. And the topic was, if you could time travel, where and when would you go? And how would you spend the day? And this is what she wrote. If I could time travel, I would go back in time to the 70s. The bond I have with my grandma is indescribable. She's one of the most selfless people I know. I always notice if you needed anything, she would be there for you in an instant. No questions asked. She dropped everything just to be there for you. It didn't matter the favor. She just wanted you to know she'll always be your number one supporter. My grandma, Sylvia, is a young soul. Even though she is 75, she still acts like a teenager, a wise one. <laughs> she gives the best advice, and you could tell it truly comes from her heart. I love the memories of us sitting in the living room, watching our favorite movies together while making me laugh with her numerous stories from her youth. She is one of the strongest people I know. I aspire to be just like her. Three years ago, she was diagnosed with kidney failure. At that moment, I was so scared to lose my best friend given to me at birth. Not only is she strong, but is optimistic about her situation and doesn't allow it to ruin her life. She always tells me the 70s were the highlight of her life when she felt like she most lived. She grew up in New York City where the world never sleeps. The words she used to describe her life back then make me wish I could have experienced it with her too. If I could go back in time, it would be to experience one day with her in her early 20s in the city and to have more time with memories we could share from that day. I would go out shopping with her, go to our favorite Italian restaurant, and laugh ab about randomly silly things that only she and I would understand. I would, it wouldn't matter where I was as long as I, as I was with her. She is the most loving, generous person. So experiencing a day full of activities I know I would never forget is enough for me to say I lived a good life. Knowing some of her qualities and traits are in me, I am content. Not only is she a wise person, she truly understands how to love and make you feel loved. She has greatly influenced my life, so spending one day couldn't be enough, but it, makes, but it makes me so grateful to have a chance of experiencing that lifetime era with her. And by the way, Paulette comes out and tells me one day, guess, guess where she used to go? She said, every night she'd be at Studio 54. <laughs> and 
for those of you who don't know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, a lot of you know, okay, but uh, uh, Studio 54 outside of the famous people, Andy Warhol and that crowd, people would line up who were not famous and there would be a guy at the door and he said, you come in, you out. And she'd be in there every night. And as she told Paulette, she'd come back very late, take off her high heels, change, and go to work. <laughs> That's her. And the good news about her, last week, she was running Paulette out of dialysis. I'm going home. Paulette wanted to say something to her. I'm going. I have to go. Uh, I have to go to NYU. Let go. That was last week, okay? So everybody said, where, where, where's she going? She got a kidney. She got a kidney. She had a run to NYU Langone. They had a kidney for her. And it came from Montana and was on the roof of Langone. She had her operation. She has no pain. And a couple of days ago, she was home. But I, I called her while she was in the hospital, not the next day. I waited. She picked up the cell phone. And I said, how are you doing? Oh, Demetra, it's great. I said, How's, what's happening? Oh, she says, they're doing a sonogram on my belly. <laughs> and I'm going, oh my god, she picked up the cell phone. And they're doing a sonogram on her belly. That's her, that, that, that character. And she's fine, she has no pain, and everything is great. So, good news for her. Moving forward, looking at the amazing gift of life, how will we choose to live it? And the poem, some of you might have heard of it, it's called Live Your Dash. It's written by Linda Ellis, and this is how it goes. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning, dash, 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 to the end, said the tombstone. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke the following date with tears. But he said, what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For the dash represents all the time that we spent alive on earth. And now only those who love them know what that little dash is worth. If only, two words. This guy was fired from his job and he was upset, truly upset for a lot of reasons. And he calls his friend. His friend happened to be a psychiatrist. And he's call calling him and he said, I just got fired from our job and he's carrying on. And the friend says, do you have time? Can you meet me in a half an hour at such and such a restaurant? And uh, you can talk about it. And he said, yes. So the, the friend comes down, they sit down, they have dinner together, and basically they have a conversation. But basically, this is what he's saying. If only I had stayed longer hours, maybe I wouldn't be fired. If only I had shown him my creative project, maybe I wouldn't have been fired. If only, that was the key in this whole conversation. So they finish dinner and the psychiatrist's friend says, do you have time to come up to my office for a few minutes? I want you to listen to a couple of tapes. All right, they go up, he puts the first tape on, and the first uh, tape is a divorcee, a divorcee, 
and she's having a conversation, but in this conversation, which I'm highlighting, the divorce says she was divorced by her husband. Her husband divorced her. If only I hadn't gone out with my friend so often, leaving him alone. If only I hadn't been so focused on my career, only I never asked him about his career and how things were going and how he felt. That was the divorcee. And then a widow whose husband died of an illness. I guess that's how we die anyway, but okay. We have a couple of doctors in the house. <laughs> All right. And this is what the widow said whose husband died. If only I paid closer attention to his complaints of feeling pain. If only I, ac I accompanied him when he went to the doctor. If only I had realized how important he was in my life. So he turns to the friend and he says, what do these people have in common? And he said, they came to you for help. <laughs> no, he says, these people were saying, if only. He said, do you know when, as a psychiatrist and a patient, I know my patients are getting better? He says, when they start using, they stop using if only, and they start saying, next time. And the joke could be they go down to get a taxi, somebody jumps in front of them, and they miss the taxi. So the guy turns to the psychiatrist and says, next time we're getting the taxi. Yeah. OK. Uh, there's something here that I had found saying, take time. And I'd like to read it to you. Take time to be truthful. It is the replacement of lies and mistakes. Take time to think. It is deep thoughts that clears the mind. Take time to express yourself. It is the only way to get true understanding. Take time to relate. It is a source of power. Take time to play. It is the secret of perpetual youth. Take time to pray. It is the greatest power on earth. Take time to read. It is the fountain of wisdom. Take time to love and be loved. It is a God-given privilege. Take time to be friendly. It is the road to happiness. Take time to laugh. It is the music of the soul. Take time to give. It is short, too short of a day uh, to be selfish. Take time to work. It is the price of success. Take time to do charity. It is the key to heaven. And one more that I'm going to end with. Before I say that, this Dr. Rachel Raymond, who was a medical doctor and started this institute about compassion, working with patients with compassion and caring, uh, she had written, that is why you were born, to find the hidden light in everyone and everything and change the world. This is what she believes. And at one point, I believe I missed it, but she had said, I looked around, personally, I looked around to see how, or why life was broken, only to discover it was not broken, that we had within us, each of us, a light within. And that was, that was her. And just to show you, my sister said, don't read that story. And, then, and, and, and wait, and then this morning, she says, maybe you should put it in. And I said, you know what? 
just to compare all the complications that we have in our life, I want you to see about this young man and the story that the sister writes about him. And it's called, God Lives Under the Bed. I envy Kevin, my brother. My brother thinks God lives under the bed. At least that's what I heard him say one night. He was praying out loud in his dark bedroom and I stopped to listen. Are you there, God? He said. Where are you? Oh, I see. Under the bed. I giggled softly and tiptoed off to my own room. Kevin's unique perspectives are often a source of amusement, but that night, something else lingered long after the humor. I realized for the first time the very different world Kevin lives in. He was born 30 years ago, mentally disabled, as a result of difficulties during labor. Apart from his size, he's six foot, two inches tall. There are a few ways in which he is an adult. He reasons and communicates with the capabilities of a seven-year-old, and he always will. He will probably always believe that God lives under the bed that Santa Claus is the one who fills the space under our tree every Christmas, and that airplanes stay up in the sky because angels carry them. I remember wondering if Kevin realized he is different. Is he ever dissatisfied with his monotonous life? Up before dawn each day, off to work at a workshop for the disabled, home to walk our cocker spaniel, return to eat his favorite macaroni and cheese for dinner, and later to bed. The only variation in the entire scheme is laundry, when he hovers excitedly over the washing machine like a mother with her newborn child. He does not seem dissatisfied, he lopes out to the bus every morning at 7.05, eager for a day of simple work. He wrings his hands excitedly while the water boils on the stove before dinner. And he stays up late twice a week to gather our dirty laundry for his next day's laundry chores. And Saturdays, oh, the bliss of Saturdays, that's the day my dad takes Kevin to the airport to have a soft drink, watch the planes land, and speculate loudly on the destination of each passenger inside. That's one, that one's going to Chicago, Kevin shouts as he claps his hands. His anticipation is so great he can hardly sleep on Friday nights. And so goes his world of daily rituals and weekend field trips. He doesn't know what it means to be discontent. His life is simple. He will never know the entanglements of wealth, of power. He does not care what brand of clothing he wears or what kind of food he eats. He needs, his needs have always been met and he never worries that one day they may not be. His hands are diligent. Kevin is never so happy and as when he is working, when he unloads the dishwasher or vacuums the carpet, his heart is completely in it. He does not shrink from a job when it is begun and he does not have a job, he does not leave a job until it is finished. But when his tasks are done, Kevin knows how to relax. 
He is not obsessed with his work or the work of others. His heart is pure. He still believes everyone tells the truth, promises must be kept, and when you are wrong, you apologize instead of argue. Free from pride and unconcerned with appearances, Kevin is not afraid to cry when he is hurt, angry, or sorry. He's always transparent, always sincere, and he trusts God. Not confined by intellectual reasoning, when he comes to Christ, he comes as a child. Kevin seems to know God, to really be friends with him in a way that is difficult for an educated person to grasp. God seems like his closest companion. In my moments of doubt and frustration with my Christianity, I envy the security Kevin has in his simple faith. It is then that I am most willing to admit that he has some divine knowledge that rises above my moral questions. It is then that I realize that perhaps he's not the one with a handicap. I am. My obligations, my fear, my pride, my circumstances, they all become disabilities when I do not trust them to God's care. Who knows if Kevin comprehends things I can never learn. After all, he has spent his whole life in that kind of innocence, praying after dark and soaking in the goodness and love of God. Yeah.